Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our second annual uh, Fall Concrete Seminar Series. Uh, for the next three uh, lunch hours, uh, we have some very interesting presentations for you. Uh, we're going to start today with uh, Brad Knight from Master Builders Solutions. Brad uh, is a certified engineering technician with over 35 years of experience in underground mining and civil construction, involved in almost all aspects of mining, including sprayed concrete, backfill, injection, and thin support liners. He's also involved in both TBM and NATM type tunnel projects with experience on annulus grouts, soil conditioners, sealing greases, sprayed concrete, waterproofing, and injection. So Brad's presentation will be approximately 45 minutes long. Uh, if you have questions, uh, please write them in the uh, question box on the uh, left hand, right-hand side of your screen, and we will uh, get to them at the end of Brad's presentation. All of the attendees are in mute mode, and that, that will stay that way throughout the presentation. So uh, I would like to have Brad start the presentation. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as uh, Alain said, uh, we're going to be talking about sprayed concrete. Um, I am the underground construction area manager for Master Builder Solutions. As Elaine said, with 35 plus years of uh, experience, both with mining and tunneling. I manage Eastern North America for Master Builder Solutions, both the US and Canada, in the mining and tunneling and everything underneath that. So to start off, spray concrete. Here's uh, some of the topics we'll be looking at today. Uh, definition, some of the origins or history. There's a wet, wet or dry process. Uh, some of the MIC design and QC uh, uh, considerations uh, when you're looking at spray concrete. On-site quality control, uh, some different applications or references, and then uh, for then some questions. <clears throat> So the ACI definition of shockrete or sprayed concrete. Shockrete, according to the American Concrete Institute, is defined as pneumatically applied mortar or concrete projected at high velocity. History. Uh, the history of shockrete goes way back to 1907, where Carl Akeley, he was a taxidermist in Chicago, he sprayed mortar on the skeleton of bones to protect them against pollution. So you can see Carl Akeley, some of the guns that were used, you can see this is called a double chamber. Uh, actually in refractory business today, not quite that unit, but something similar to the same mechanical and technical aspects are used to this day. Obviously you can see the work that was done back in those days. Uh, you can see the uh, sp spray unit there uh, into Austria and then up to the Crossrail project in England where they're using robotically sprayed um, uh, uh, shockrete and waterproofing membranes. So sprayed concrete, dry and wet process. So the dry process. So as you can see here, uh, it's recommended that you uh, use a pre-bag material in a pre-dampener. Uh, it's it, unfortunately not used as much as it should be. What it does, it gives you an opportunity to, number one, reduce the dust, and then number two, it uh, it starts the hydration of the cement. Uh, it's put into a, a, a shockrete gun. Um, there's many different types, but uh, usually rotary uh, barrel. Uh, so you have air fed to the machine, you have water fed to the nozzle. So your nozzle man is your, your batch person, your mixing person, the person that's going to give you the quality. So obviously you want to uh, educate and have a person that understands water cement ratios, understands concrete, um, utilizing uh, the, the nozzle because that is where your quality control is. So it, there's also, you can feed these machines with a smaller bag such as this or the bulk bags, which is mostly 95% is what you see is the, the large bulk bags uh, uh, 
feeding the dry shock reed unit. The wet mix process. So the wet mix process is, uh, you know, you get a concrete pump uh, fed to a spray concrete machine. As you can see here, you got a ready mix truck, concrete pump, air compressor, and then uh, accelerator added at the nozzle. So all your quality control is in the ready mix truck. So if you define water cement ratio, we'll talk about that later. This is just an example of a robotic sprayer in a mine. Uh, concrete pump and then a transmixer uh, that can be used in mines or tunnels. What are the advantages and disadvantages of the wet process? Excuse me, higher quality control, so you have a controlled water cement ratio. Working environment is healthier, uh, much less dust because all the materials are wetted out. Less rebound, typically in dry, you'll uh, be around uh, 15 to 25%, and I've seen as high as 50% if you're not following the proper uh, <clears throat> application protocols. Uh, whereas in wet, it's usually five to 10. Um, it's a higher volume output, 15 cubic meters per hour in wet, as compared to five cubic meters per hour in dry. You can utilize any of the newer admixture technology that is uh, uh, that is being uh, brought to the market. It's a very ideal for fiber application. Uh, there is some fiber used in dry, but there's a, a lot of rebound. And it's an economical in place because you've got less rebound and, and, and you're, you can actually apply a lot faster. So it's 30% to 40% lower than dry shockery. Your major disadvantages are it's not conducive to a small project, so you'd want to stick with a dry shock read if you just have a small couple hundred meters, 20 meters, 50 meters. But if you have a large project, uh, uh, you can use them because of the higher copal co cost for equipment. And at the end of a shift, there is a cleaning of the pumps and lines. They all have to be cleaned out. And then if you're hand spraying, it's a much heavier line weight if you're hand spraying as compared to dry. So shockrete spray concrete, uh, let's take a look at some of the mixed design considerations and some of the quality control considerations as well. But first, what you wanna find out with your mixed design, what is required? What is the purpose of the shockrete? What are your project specifications? And what are the requirements? So for example, as a primary ground control, do you need early strength? Do you need late strength? Is it secondary ground control? All of these things, is it hard rock, ground, uh, soft rock, and is it temporary or permanent support? All of these considerations should be looked at in, in, in making, doing your mix design, working on your mix design. Uh, the common materials that uh, you will see, obviously like a concrete mix, it's aggregate cement, supplementary additions, water admixtures, set accelerators, and fibers. So taking a look at uh, a simplified mix design, this is just kind of a typical one, giving you an idea of what you're looking for. So aggregates, uh, zero to 10 millimeter. Um, I have used 12, but you get a bigger rebound, more rebound and bigger uh, rebound pockets. Uh, 1,700 kilograms, I'll talk about it more, but definitely get the correct grading. Cement, uh, 400 to 480 kilograms, all per cubic meter, these numbers. Uh, You'll check your reactivity. We'll we'll talk about that. Potable water, just like normal concrete. Plasticizers, two to five kilograms per cubic meter, depending on the uh, concentrate concentration of the plasticizer, the type of plasticizer. Um, workability minimum is usually one and a half hours. You're looking at a slump around 200 to 220 millimeters, or a flow about 60 centimeters. And we'll discuss that. Other additions, uh, potential are fibers, steel fibers, 30 to 60 kilograms per cubic meter. Uh, polypropylene fibers, five to seven kilograms per, cu per cubic meter. There, there is other quality enhancing admixtures, such as potentially for shrinkage uh, reducing admixtures um, and, and other types of technologies. And uh, at the nozzle. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit as well. Alkali, alkali free accelerator, uh, typically around 20 to 40 liters per cubic meter, depending on your dosage and the amount of cementitious materials you have in your mixed design. 
Number one key thing that I, uh, if you get this right, you get this straight, like an everyday normal concrete mix, you have to get at your aggregates high quality. Uh, as I stated, 10 millimeter. Uh, our European colleagues uh, like maximum of eight millimeter. Uh, so you have a good quality aggregate, optimum gradation, <clears throat> particle shape and free of reactive chemicals and, and that may promote alkali acid acid reaction. The most commonly used for myself in uh, North America is the ACI 506 gradation number two and then uh, there's a lot of uh, European uh, consultants coming in for uh, some of these big projects that we've seen in Canada especially in uh, the GTA in the Toronto area, Montreal and Vancouver. Uh, you're seeing the FNARC uh, uh, type uh, uh, specifications for aggregates as well. Binders or uh, cementitious materials or the cements. Uh, obviously, uh, there's a type 1 to 5 in the USA, the old type 10 to 50 in Canada, but the newer type, uh, newer names, well, newest. Uh, typically, what we will see is general use, uh, about 90 to 95% of uh, the shock rate mixes uh, I've been working with over time. Um, but we also, every once in a while, we'll see a high early strength as well. Um, those are the two most common that, that we see. Additions. Uh, uh, so materials of shocker supplementary additions, uh, they react with the components of cement. They may be added to replace some of the cement, prove, prove, uh, provide enhanced properties such as durability. Uh, three, three main additions are used. Uh, fly ash, it's a relatively slow reaction with cement. Uh, we don't see too much fly ash because of the availability, but when we had it, uh, I've seen lots of mixes with fly ash, 10 to 20% was your placement. Uh, GGBS, uh, slower reaction with the cement. Um, typically what I see is 20 to 30%. I have seen 35. Uh, and then there's some, there has been some trials with much higher 50 to 60% uh, mix, but you don't see that too often as of yet. Uh, due to the fact that the accelerator is working with the cement and very uh, does not work that well with the uh, GGBS. Silica fume, uh, 6 to 10 percent, average is around 8 percent. And you're seeing some colloidal silica mainly in the mines uh, to replace the silica fume uh, because they're not looking for durability. Uh, it's, it's short term and it gives a, uh, a, a good quality mix. Um, with colloidal silica. As far as admixtures, uh, there's many different types of admixtures, but the most common ones you will see water reducing, which are mid range and high range. Typically, it's high range because you want to get down to that 0 0.40, 0 0.38 potential water cement ratio. Stabilize, we do see stabilizers and retarders. I prefer the stabilizer because the shock rate accelerator more effectively uh, kills off the stabilizer than the retarder. It still works with retarders, but not to the same degree as the uh, stabilizer. Just there's a, a, a much higher uh, reaction, uh, a killing reaction of the, uh, of the accelerator on the stabilizer than, than there is in retarders. And then if your aggregates are a little bit out of spec, not a lot out of spec, then we have uh, got involved with some mixes with viscosity modifiers because um, uh, I'll show you some pictures later, references, putting concrete down eight, nine, 10,000 feet, uh, 2,000, 2,500 meters. You want to make sure you have a non-segregating mix, as you can see on the right. Um, uh, add at the nozzles are accelerators. See a little bit of history. There used to be uh, one called aluminate-based accelerators. Uh, they're very dangerous. They burn on contact. Um, very rarely see them. There's, they're basically outlawed from what I understand in Canada. Uh, you may see very rarely now in the States, but it's, they're basically gone, thank God. Uh, Silica-based, uh, it's an older technology, sodium silica, but we still have mines and tunnels uh, using silica-based. But the uh, number one uh, accelerator of choice is the, uh, the alkali-free accelerators. 
Uh, there's uh, newer technology. I say newer, uh, even though we've been using them for 20 years, but there's been newer uh, alkali-free technologies within the alkali-free accelerator realm. And they're a much safer accelerator as compared to especially the aluminum based. Hydration control admixtures. In any minor tunnel, uh, you, you need time to get to the face for consumption. So in tr traditional sprayed concrete, if you're within one to two hours, you can batch it, deliver it, and consume it if it's uh, half decently close. Now with hydration control stabilized stabilizing admixtures, um, what you'll see is manufactured deliver uh, intermediate storage that could be a, a holding vessel or that could be like a trans mixer or even just the ready mix truck itself if it's on a tunnel site, tunnel project site, and three to 72 hours. I have uh, actually did a trial with 72 hours uh, up in Sudbury in my career, early in my career, we did, uh, we shock created three days in a row uh, and the shock was all high quality um, and, and, and it, it stabilized for 72 hours. Obviously due to economic uh, uh, in, or considerations, you, would, you, you, you wouldn't want to use it very often, but typically in mines, what we look to stabilize because we're going down uh, boreholes or down ramps, four to six hours, up to eight hours in mines and on some tunnel projects, I've seen six and 12 hours. So rather than uh, waiting all, having a, a batch plant open all night, they'll deliver, they'll order the uh, shock reap for six o'clock at night, 12 hour stabilization, and they use it throughout the evening. And the uh, accelerator burns off the, the uh, stabilizer and gives you your early set times. Almost all large tunnels <coughs> and mines use a stabilizer of some sort. Set accelerators uh, are added during the concrete application on site. The uh, most key important about that is uh, the nozzle. They're fast setting, they give you early strength development, they increase your layer thickness for the accelerator, uh, improved overhead spraying performance and very high productivity. So if you take a look at this, this nozzle, so you have your concrete coming through here, uh, sorry, your air in your accelerator and your concrete coming through here. Uh, so as the accelerator goes into the air, you got double entry, double port into the mixing vessel or the mixing head, which is here. So it's all rifled around and then pushed out through the through the uh, the nozzle tip. And make sure your nozzle tip is a high quality uh, that uh, constrains it, so it it it, it applies properly. Um, key point is you sometimes will see. Uh, entry in one side, one port happens. You end up get build up on this side due to the fact that you're only hitting one side. So uh, I do see that at times it can be done, but if you want the optimum for uh, sprayed concrete on the face, high quality uh, sprayed concrete, you want to use a, a double port entry system. Fiber reinforced shockrete and improves your durability, your ductility, your impact resistance. It resists flexural and shear loading, offers safer working conditions because you're not installing the wire mesh. You're installing wire mesh, you're handling it. Uh, potential safety considerations there. Uh, it it re reduces your rebound and your sloughing because of the, the screen. The screen is loose. Uh, it reduces material usage do, and reduces final costs and it's actually resistance to drill and blast operations. So obviously what you can see here, you're following the substrate. So whatever thickness you're looking for, if you're looking for two to four inches or um, 50 to 100 mil, you, you'll, you'll get your 100 mil, whereas wire mesh you're filling in and you're ending up with much more shock rate. So as far as steel fibers, many uh, configuration, different types of steel. Um, so your fiber lengths are typically 19 to 35 millimeters, dosage of 30, 35 to 65. Uh, you take a look at your amount of fibers per kilograms, 10,000 to 15,000 uh, in the steel fibers. Uh, very good in uh, seismic active ground, uh, a lot of use in permanent structures, civil tunneling projects. Uh, synthetic fibers are coming to the, a lot in now into even 
uh, the uh, civil tunneling projects, for example, the Crosslinks project uh, stations that were just finished were all macrosynthetic. Uh, you're at its mixer at the batch plant or through a fiber dispenser. Um, you know, just care must be taken during handling because of the steel the steel fibers. The macrosynthetic structural polypropylene fibers. Your dosage range of three to nine kilograms. Typically, what I'm seeing is six or seven kilograms per cubic meter. Uh, fiber lengths of 30 to 65. Right now, average is 50, around 54, 58 millimeters. Uh, most most projects. Uh, notice the fibers per kilogram is up to 20 to 20 to 70 thousand. So a lot more fibers available for your for your support. Uh, they can come corrugated, fibrillated, embossed, or hydrophilic. Uh, they use large area, areas where large deformations are expected. Larger cart crack widths are expected, uh, almost exclusively in mining. Uh, added to the mixture at the batch plant or through a fiber dispenser, and they're user friendly, so no skin puncture uh, in place at, uh, at the site. The same performance requirements apply to shock rate materials as for high quality concrete um that was a statement of a mentor of mine george yagi and you know it's it's so true uh shockrete is a uh, very high quality concrete it, it is very close to an scc mix due to the water cement ratio the amount of cementitious materials so when we first are looking at a mixed design uh, on a site we look at early strength so we want to make sure our cement and our accelerator are compatible. So we do a test, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, using a BICAD needle. Um, we determine the water cement ratio, as I stated, 0 0.38, typically to 0 0.42. I have seen as high as 0 0.45. You weigh the water in the cement, you uh, intensively mix for two minutes until you have a hom homogeneous paste is obtained. You add three to 10% of accelerator, uh, historically or, nominal, or normally around 8% and mix for a maximum five seconds. This is a little bit of an art to this to do this because if you over mix it, you break down the, the chemical reaction between the accelerator and the cement. So it has to be no more than five seconds. After mixing, you fill a test cup, place it under the manual VICAT needle and start measuring the penetration. The needle needs to stop uh, one to two millimeters from the bottom of the cement paste for your initial set and your final set <coughs> cannot penetrate the cement paste. So this is giving you an indicator that your cement and your accelerator are working together. There's different types of chemistries in both cements and accelerators and you just want to make sure that you have, uh, have a, a, a cement accelerator that are, that are working together. So once we've got that, we have our mixed design, we use the proper aggregates, we have our proper water cement ratio. We've tested that we were batching it and we've got it in the truck. Now test the job site. So obviously temperature uh, with temperatures, the lowest I ever wanna see is 18 degrees Celsius because the lower the concrete temperature or shockrete temperature, the lower your early strength. And typically in tunnels and mines uh, and, and uh, hanging overhead, you want you want uh, your your uh, your fastest early strengths. So temperature uh, and and maximum usually around 26, 28. I have sprayed around 30 in some of the deep areas of mines, but you're looking somewhere around 18 to 25 is kind of a, a number you'd like to see. Uh, slump and flow. So slump uh, 200 to 220. Uh, plus or minus 20, something along that line, like 220 plus or minus 20. A nice flowing uh, mix with your flow. You're looking around 60, 6, 50 to 60, 55 to 65 on the uh, flow uh, flow table. Air content. Uh, most shockrete that I work with uh, is not. I know in Quebec they do they they utilize air in all their shockrete in Quebec. Uh, air in um, in the mines, uh, there there there's not a concern. There's no air air put in because it's not affected by freeze thaw. And even a lot of the tunnel projects uh, uh, do not uh, uh, do not add an air into the mix. But there are applications where they do. 
So what they do is they, they'll put up a fairly high amount of air, 10 to 12 uh, percent, uh, because what the operation of going through the concrete pump and then going through the nozzle and applied on the wall reduces a lot of that air. So one thing about to state on that, it is uh, difficult to, to know how much air is in situ on the face um, due to the fact of the operation of the shock rate machine. So early strength testing. So you've uh, sprayed your 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 uh, your substrate, and you've got uh, you want to know what strength you're getting and what amount of time. So for the early strength, uh, zero to one point two MPa was typically within the first hour to hour and a half. And if you're getting a slower shock rate setting, it might be an hour and a half to two hours. But what you're looking for is 1.2 MPa. Um, there's two methods. Uh, the older one that's been around for probably 30 years, I would say, is the Mako handheld uh, uh, shock rate pentrometer. But lately, in the last five, 10 years, uh, uh, the, the McMesson uh, electronic pentrometer, much easier to carry around, and it works just as well or, or very well as, as well. Then once you've got that early strength at 1.2 MPa, because that's as far as you can go with those two, two units, then you change over to a Hilti gun. Now the Hilti gun is uh, 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 an apparatus that you can purchase from Hilti, obviously, and it's for testing 1.2 to 20 MPa uh, with the green shot. Uh, then if you go to the yellow shot, I think you can test up to 40 or 50 MPa. Most times, most projects, they're more interested in that uh, one to four to five, six MPA to see where they get that in, in the first four to six hours, because they do want to re-enter into this, the operation and, and, and bring people and equipment back in. And specifications I've seen in tunnels is around one MPA in one hour uh, before re-entry. Mines are a little bit more, uh, they want to see like two MPA and uh, typically around two to four MPA, depending on the mine um yeah so that's that's what you're looking for and then you're going to get your typically 40 to 50 mpa strengths at 28 days so that's just for you know the first one to 12 hours typically with these two testing methods just give you an idea of it uh so this is the up to one hour is obviously the the mcmesson or the uh makeup pentrometer just you can see them pushing in there measure 10, me 10 measurements uh, every time you try it. You can try it six minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, obviously 30, 40, 50, or whatever you feel like, just to see how it's moving within the first hour. And then, oops, then you go to the Hilti where you fire nails into the chakri. And, this, and then what you do is you measure the distance of the nail, and then you, uh, you, uh, Put this and enter that into a program. There's a program that you enter that into. Then you do a pullout test with the pullout unit, uh, testing unit. It'll give you a measure in, in kilonewtons, and then you enter that in the program and you enter the time so you'll know what strength you're getting at what time. And with here as well, whatever time element you're testing at, you do do 10 minutes as well here. Or 10, sorry, 10, 10 readings not 10 minutes, 10 readings. So testing a fiber reinforced shock rate, this is for uh, energy absorption and load absorption cap capacity. There's two tests that are utilized in North America. Uh, the most common one now from what I have seen on sites is the round determinant, uh, round determinant panel, which is the ASTM C1550. It's a circular 800 millimeter by 75 millimeter three point resting center loading. As you can see the center loading there. The FNARC is a square plate test, 600 by 600. You have a four point resting center loading. Uh, what a lot of the consultants and contractors like about the RDP is it's a much easier uh, panel to make and to, to test you have to cut this out to that square so this panel here will have to be cut out to that 600 by 600 um, to make sure you have you come up with this type of a unit so just uh, giving you an idea of the rdp 
the uh, rounding terminal panel uh, mold that you can see on the top left. Uh, so that's sprayed uh, when I'm a good applicator, a good distance away, one to one and a half meters away. Um, then it's uh, once the mold is demolded, uh, you can do hand spraying as well. Uh, once it's demolded, you center it for load, uh, load this uh, shockery panel, and then it's uh, it's loaded uh, up to 40 millimeters under ASTM C 1550. Uh, a closed loop uh, monitoring system should should be used, and a, a good high quality testing unit. And this is what you're looking for: is three equal radii uh, in the in the uh, in the test. If you've got a break that goes straight through, it's 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 not a good test. It's not it's not to be acceptable. So, um, different applications. Just going to give you an idea of. Oops. Let's see what happened there. So this is uh, Kid Creek Mine. Uh, Shockreed is still being uh, sent down uh, this uh, mine up in Timmins, Ontario. Sorry about the. Uh, the names are, I meant to take them out. So this mine is 9,500 feet, 9,800 feet. Um, so in 2000, 2001, they decided to go mine D, which is from uh, 6,800 level down to here. And they wanted, a, they had a, they had two boreholes coming down to 4,600 level. So what did they want to do is have a borehole slick line that would go down to the 10,000, well, to 9,800 foot level. And, and and we were able to do that. Um, this is just an idea. This is uh, uh, the plant. Uh, you can see the borehole, and then that's the top of the borehole. That's the bottom of the borehole. Um, in this case, uh, it actually went down to 9,800 feet. I think I might have have that wrong. So 9,800 feet. So you can imagine you have to have a high quality, uh, non-segregating mix so this mix would have been like the 200 to 220 millimeter uh, slump uh, six, uh, 60, 600 millimeter flow um, and, and and the other key point about this is the maintenance and and the uh, of, of the borehole these boreholes are worth one to one and a half million dollars a piece so you do not want to plug them um, most of that shock rate is stabilized uh, obviously, another interesting note, this is what they call a um, energy dissipation vessel, known by the miners as the boot. So basically, your concrete's coming down, and it hits here, uh, then it goes here. So that's like takes the energy and goes into the transmixer. And, and trust me, uh, when you're down underground, when concrete or shockery is hitting from 10,200 or 9,800 feet, it, it's... Uh, it's pretty loud and, and, you, and you're not on the transmixer like this gentleman is. Niagara Falls Tunnel Project, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of it. Uh, this was, uh, I think, 2006 to 2010. So it's been a while, but uh, this project, one of the largest, I think, shotcrete supplied projects in North America. Um, 150,000 cubic meters of wet shock rate, 250,000 of cast in place shock rate. Uh, just go back. So this was called Big Becky. Uh, this the diameter of this tunnel is 15.2 meters. At that time, it was uh, I apologize, 14.2 meters. At that time, it was the largest diameter T hard rock TBM in the world. I think it's been surpassed since then, but uh, it's quite the unit. You can see um, these. These. This is where the two spray arms would do 360, 360 degrees in the tunnel. Just some pictures. You can see the uh, uh, the lattice and girdering. You can see the uh, shockery being applied, uh, both like 360 degrees around. These are the transmixers that are pulled into the tunnel project. They were 15 cubic meters and they can be pulled both ways. So one guy would pull one way, they'd lock that truck in and then the other truck uh, trans truck would pull it out. These are just a couple examples of where shockrete has been used uh, in other places uh, and, and especially for you know unique geometries where 
you wouldn't it'd be so difficult to do this with a cast in place, but you can see this is the exchange plates crossover tunnels in, in, uh, in New Jersey. Um, there's a Weehawken tunnel shaft and station in, in New Jersey, USA. You can just see the shocker being applied 90 degrees uh, uh, from the shock read face and one to one and a half meters away. This is a crosslink project in Toronto, 80,000 plus cubic meters of shock read fibers. They were a, a, a macro synthetic fiber. They're three stationed Avenue Road, Laird and Oakwood. Um, it was a very, it, this is one of the most, one of, one of the more unique because it was the macro synthetic fibers. Um, it was a very challenging project, obviously uh, above ground, you, you, you can't have any subsidence. Um, just wanted to show you, this is what you're looking for in application. 80 degrees, right, distance away. This wasn't at the crossing project, this is at the uh, training facility that we have in every year. Uh, and you can see there were lots of, that's a very high quality application. Pulsation fee, it has a pulse pump um, as well. Other applications uh, rock slope stabilizations, earth embankments, creek channeliz channelization, containment berms. Um, a lot of people do not feel or do not think that you can finish. Uh, shockrete, uh, that's absolutely not correct. You can take a look at the right, look at how uh, that, the, the quality of that finishing there. You can see the quality of the finishing here, 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 all the way around. Uh, it, there's an art to it. Uh, I, I would agree, 100% agree. It's, a, it's, you know, you have, when you shockrete the last layer, you want to make sure you can use a little bit of accelerator, but you can't use too much because you, you have to finish it. So, uh, there, you can do anything you can do with concrete. You can do with shockery with respect to aesthetics and finishing. Um, uh, people who are Canadian, obviously, will note, note the uh, Canada's Wonderland. So there's a lot of rockscapes. Uh, these, these, these. I have not been involved with a lot of the uh, rockscape work, but uh, it, it's amazing the work they do. How they make it look exactly like rock. Uh, they, they, these people are truly artists. And, and again, as you can see, you see Canada's Wonderland, that, that's all shockrete. I've been on top of it and underneath there, and it's, it's quite the amazing uh, structure, to say the least. So that, uh, that comes to the end of my presentation. This is just another picture of, uh, of the Crosslinks uh, project. Um, so I'd like to thank you for listening, uh, and thank you for, for uh, coming to the presentation. So I'll uh, open up my camera and go to questions. Well, um, Brad, thank you for the presentation. Uh, you must have done a tremendous job because you answered all the questions with your presentation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't see any questions right now on the, uh, on the board. Uh, if any of the attendees uh, have a question, you can type them in quickly. Uh, we have a couple of minutes uh, available to you. Uh, if not, let me just remind you uh, that uh, tomorrow at the same time from noon till one o'clock, uh, we have our second of our series of presentations. Uh, tomorrow it's um, low carbon future for the cement and concrete industries with uh, Adam Auer of the Cement Association of Canada and Bart Cantors from Concrete Ontario doing the presentation. And then on Thursday the 28th, um, Lloyd Keller from Ellis Dawn uh, will be doing an update on Canadian concrete standards to uh, avoid slab rejection. So uh, once again, uh, I would like to thank Brad 
I don't see any questions on, oh, wait a second, there I is one, one here. No. Yeah, there is one. How is concrete, uh, how is shot creep pre-qualified on Metrolinks and I.O. projects, I believe it says? So how did, can you answer that one, uh, Brad? Well, um, Metrolinks would put out a specification and then uh, they oh, would- your, your camera's on, Brad. <laughs> What's that? Your camera is on. Okay. Oh, and then, oh, there's more questions coming in. So if you can add that one, I'll do that one over again. How can you, oh, wait a second here. How is Shot Creek pre-qualified on Metrolinks and IO projects? Oh, your cam, you're, uh, you're, you're muted. I apologize. That's all right. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. So yeah, so with the Metrolinks projects, uh, they decide they, they put out their specifications, um, and in some cases, the general contractors uh, uh, will 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 invite, obviously, a number of different suppliers, being the ready mix producers, to uh, and so the con the general contractors will will work with uh, the the ready mix producers, and obviously, the ready mix producers will work with suppliers to uh, to to match the specifications that Metrolinks have asked for. Now, in some cases, in, in the Crosslinks, the, the general contractor uh, wanted to uh, wanted the macro synthetic type fiber, so they worked with the ready mix producer and the uh, and the supplier to get it approved. So it, 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 Metrolinks put out their 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 specifications, and then uh, it, through Typically, a uh, a uh, consultant uh, owner's rep, so to speak, and then uh, and then there's um, you know testing and trials, all those trials that I showed you that will we were all done the uh, the early strength, the uh, Hilti, the of course slumped and all that, that that's normal. So all, and then the RDPs, um, all all of Metrolinks lately have been RDPs, rounded term of panel, ACTMC 1550. So that's how that comes along. All right, uh, we have another question. Shot Creek for the Crosslinks project was delivered by ReadyMix truck. Yes, hundred percent. Yeah, it was ReadyMix. ReadyMix producer would deliver it, and then what would happen was uh, it'd be put down into transmixers. Uh, the, I showed you the one picture on the equipment with the transmixers, which are used in both the mining and tunneling. So it'd be bucketed into those transmixers, and typically around a six to twelve hour stabilization, depending on the time of day and the temperature. If it's summertime, obviously you can back off, or, or you have to make sure you're aware of it because if you're at 30 degrees Celsius, your concrete's going to be re, uh, wearing off, that, or the stabilizing uh, ability will be wear off faster than in the winter time where you know you could probably reduce you'll you're able to reduce the admixture so that's through a ready mix producer into a transmixer fed into the tunnel project or the station or whatever whatever it is all right another question we have is what is the max vol uh, fiber volume that we can use without blockage and also the same for the max fiber length so length and volume of fiber I would say there have been 65 millimeter uh, fibers out there. I know uh, we are we're lower, a little bit lower in the length. Uh, we've had very good results, uh, 54 millimeter. Uh, there's 58, I believe 65. Uh, the 54 millimeter, why we do that is because we're concerned about blockage. Uh, so we want to get as many fibers in there. Um, and 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 we would be the maximum i've been involved with is i believe nine kilograms and i didn't like it <laughs> so we're looking at six to seven i'm just telling you average six to seven six and a half to seven and a half for for the specifications that we have to match but i i, I believe you could definitely depending on the host size so it, 
If you've got a smaller hose size, that's a big concern. Uh, the size of the concrete pump, that's another, another consideration. So I would say with a large hose size, like a three, a three inch 75 mil hose size or 80 mil, I believe it is, or 65 and 80, uh, then I would say you could probably max out around eight or nine, depending on the mix design, the aggregates, everything else, and then the size of the concrete pump. So at the max, I would say eight to nine, with a 54 millimeter, uh, I haven't had a lot of experience with a 65 millimeter, so I can't tell you uh, if if you could do it at that. But with a 54 millimeter fiber, I, I, you could definitely do eight and possibly nine. And one more: How can you reduce the carbon impact of shotcrete? Well, uh, the number one thing is through technology, new admixture technology. There's admixture technology that will reduce the amount of cement, uh, make the, the cement more effective. Uh, I don't want to mention names because it's a generic uh, presentation, but there are technologies out there. Uh, obviously, the supplementary cementing materials, so you reduce the amount of uh, cement that goes into a shock rate mix, and you are seeing that where you're seeing... Um, I apologize, you're seeing um, um, slag and fly ash, but the reality of that is as well is that uh, slag and fly ash are getting hard to find as well. There are other materials uh, that are being considered in chocolate. Anything that we use in concrete, the number one thing you need to consider or would like to consider is the application. You're, you're spraying this overhead and you have to take consider the reactivity that you need with the cement and the accelerator to get the shockrete in place. So there are definitely uh, many different ways for shockrete to become more eco-efficient and, and more uh, environmentally friendly. Uh, and we're working on that as we speak. And finally, uh, just a comment on fiber length. Typically, you don't want to exceed 60% hose diameter for max quality, uh, quantity, sorry, for max quantity, all dependent on deflection and joules required. Would this be correct? Yes, I would agree. Yeah, and I, it's all about, we've been able to, you know, with the macro synthetic fibers, most of the fibers that are in the market, not all of them, but uh, uh, let's just say, you know, get fairly high joules with existing equipment at six and a half to seven kilograms per cubic meter. Six, six and a half to seven and a half, I apologize, depending on the fiber. So I would agree with that statement. All right. Well, thank you, Brad, once again. Uh, excellent uh, presentation. And uh, we thank you uh, for uh, doing this for the chapter. Uh, and I thank everyone for attending today. And we look forward to seeing everyone again tomorrow from 12 till 1 o'clock. Um, and it, again, the topic will be low carbon future for the cement and concrete industries. Thank you for attending, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye for now. Thank you.